Hey, Agile friends. Welcome to a special series of episodes where we explore product development of a real-life application that enables remote pairing. In this first-person account of product development and remote work stories, we talk about Tuple, a remote pair programming app for macOS and Windows designed to make you feel like you're collaborating in person. If you want to know more, check out tuple.app forward slash scrum. That's T-U-P-L-E dot A-P-P forward slash scrum. And let them know you heard about them here on the podcast. For me, what's cool about these stories is how they took the user's needs to heart and put on loads of developer-specific touches you just don't see with generic screen sharing tools. Tuple has been adopted by some very large companies and public sector, more on that in the episodes this week, that work even partially remote, partially or fully, of course. So check out the app at tuple.app forward slash scrum and get their 50% off for the first three months of your subscription. That's 50% off for the first three months of your subscription. Let them know that you heard about Tuple here on the podcast by going to tuple.app forward slash scrum. One more time, T-U-P-L-E dot A-P-P forward slash scrum. And now on to the episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our team Tuesday here on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. This week, joining us from tuple.app is their head of product, Eli Goodman. Hey, Eli, welcome back. Hi. Thanks a lot, Pasco. Absolutely. So uh, for those of you who don't know Tuple, you can check out our Monday episode, or I can briefly tell you that it's a remote pairing app that caters to developers who want to have the best experience when pairing with their remote colleagues and we have their head of product here with us today which is brilliant because we can mine his head for insights that can help all product people out there so Eli as the head of product for Tuple and of course also otherwise experienced as a product manager you've seen many teams and worked with teams that uh, maybe work great and maybe some teams that didn't work so great and we don't really want to know you know if the team was great or not, but rather how they got there. So we want to explore a story of a team and how a specific behavior or pattern uh, emerged, eventually grew and caused problems for that team. So share that story with us. We'll dive into the lessons learned later. Share the story first. For sure. And there's a, this is actually interesting because there's a similar behavior that I've now seen at two different companies. Uh, and this is a fixation on A-B tests. And so I'll tell the story of one company, but it is eerily similar how similar how, how much another company replicated this same pattern. Uh, and so know, know that this is a sort of a synthesis of both. But um, A-B tests, I think, uh, and, and maybe other product people out there might be, uh, their blood pressure may have gone up when I mentioned this, because I think this is uh, part and parcel of the modern product manager's toolbox, right? Um, and I'll, I'll tell this first story or the story of this first company where um, it was a very mature engineering organization where with a lot of senior engineers, but without a ton of uh, senior product leadership. Um, and so I was in more of a product engineering uh, hybrid role at the time. So I kind of got to see both sides of this. And uh, we got some product leadership from people who had worked at some of the larger tech companies. So uh, any of the FAANG companies, think about those companies, folks from there who are used to working at enormous scale, right? And these are companies who have also really invested very heavily in A-B test framework and have also spread a lot of that orthodoxy. So coming to a team that, again, had a lot of engineering chops, but not a lot of senior product chops, they were, they were coming and saying, ah, this is a big gap in your uh, capabilities as a product organization is the ability to run these A-B tests at scale uh, and get more empirical information about what users are connecting with and what's moving the needle business-wise. Um, and so again, the initial excitement about this was really high because engineers like to build systems. In my experience, I do too. Uh, and so the prospect of building uh, the ability to do A-B tests, gather data at scale, uh, do statistical analysis. This is all stuff that I think is really juicy from an engineering perspective. Uh, and there was a lot of initial excitement around building out these capabilities and what this is going to enable us to do and learn uh, and the way we're going to be able to operate as an organization. So there was a lot of initial enthusiasm. 
Uh, but I think that, you know, you talk about a good thing becoming a bad thing. One of the one of the things that I got to see firsthand is how unbelievably costly this was to a company that, again, was not operating at that big tech company scale. That was, you know, tens of engineers, maybe 100 engineers. Um, it took a sizable chunk of the engineering team to just build out this tooling. Right. So there was this big initial outlay. Um, we got the stuff built, though, and we're able to start running A-B tests. And uh, some of the initial some of the initial results were incredibly positive as we began to find parts of the product that, were, that had high throughput, where there was a lot of opportunity to move the needle, uh, and some really discrete tests that we could run uh, where they were, the tests were very clean, and we could see an impact very visibly uh, and realize more revenue as a result. Like that's incredibly satisfying and almost addictive, right? Have a hypothesis, test it, get results, and move the needle. Um, but this ended up having an incredibly pernicious effect on the product organization as a whole. And this was a place, again, where there was not a lot of product managers. A lot of engineers were filling in that gap with their own ideas, their own intuition, uh, their own creativity. It started getting in, getting to be the case that people got really scared to do anything that wasn't A-B tested. Even the littlest changes, there was this cultural habit that developed where the, everyone would ask, well, did you run an A-B test? Running an A-B test takes time, right? You have to build it. You have to put it out there. And depending on the amount of traffic or the amount of uh, users that you're putting it in front of, wait until you achieve statistical significance. Where again, if you're not operating at big tech company scale, that can take months. Uh, and then the analysis takes time. You have to, maybe you didn't fire an event correctly and you have to retroactively go back and redo it all because the data is not there right. Maybe the analysis is kind of unclear. Maybe it's not clear who the winner is. It slowed everything down. It led to this like very fearful, very slow culture. And it was hard to walk it back because A-B tests feel empirical. They feel like science, right? And it, all of us being rational people who work with technology, we're not, we don't want to be anti-science, right? If it feels demonstrably true, who am I to say that my intuition is going to trump that? Uh, and so it really ended up slowing everything down and bloating the size of the team. We had all these data engineers, all these analysts, all this infrastructure. Uh, and yeah, I saw it happen one place and happen again. So uh, and I'm pretty sure it is happening right now somewhere where some of our <laughs> listeners are. And I really like this because, as you said, it's tempting to do everything through A-B testing because it's empirical. Like, we don't need to argue. Mm -hmm. The data is there. Of course, yeah. it's not really that way because you need to have a lot of data, as you said, to achieve statistical significance. And even then, the difference needs to be palpable, right? Like, there mm -hmm. needs to be a difference. And one of yeah. the key things that you shared in that story that, that kind of uh, hit hit home with me as I've worked in organizations that were exactly doing that kind of anti-pattern is that we, we end up taking responsibility away from ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. You will hear phrases like, well, the A-B test was inconclusive or mm -hmm. the A-B test told us we should do X, right? It's like, no, wait a minute. There, there are other things in the product that we need to take responsibility, like, like the coherence of the customer journey, right? And mm -hmm. Or even mm -hmm. highlighting parts of the product that you want the customers to go through, even though they are not the ones that, uh, you know, increase the revenue, at least in an A-B test measurable way, because there's other type of revenues that A-B testing can't measure, like yeah. subscription retention and all of that. That's not, you can't do an A-B test for that because it can take six months, a year, two years even to see any difference in that kind of metric. So uh, I think that for me, the story that you tell is, is a clear indication of an overall anti-pattern that we find reasons to be sure of our choices but unfortunately, also removing the responsibility of the choice from ourselves. What do you mm -hmm. think about yeah. that, Eli? I think it's a really, it's a really interesting way to phrase it. Where, yeah, you, you want certainty, but you don't want responsibility. Um, and I, I think that is a, it's almost like a, outside of the workplace, that feels like a human, a human bias or. Uh, I don't know what to call it weakness. It sounds a little bit negative, but uh, a human a human level anti pattern, right? It's the the desire for certainty, but the desire to not have uh, responsibility. And I I really see my own role as a product person, and I try and do this a lot at Tuple to try and cut against both of those things. I I know that I don't have a lot of certainty. I I embrace the uncertainty of what I'm doing, but I also love to own 
my enthusiasm, right? When I do have an idea that, like you said, might benefit the product, uh, I I personally try and I, I I name that it is coming from myself. I name that it's not coming from the outside, and I encourage others on the team to do the same. I think that connecting with the things that make us excited or that we think would be cool uh, or that individual customers think would be cool, right? It's okay that, a, that an idea originates from an individual. It doesn't have to come from some abstract elsewhere. And then knowing that we will never have certainty. We will never be able to fully de-risk anything until it is out in the wild, but we can always try. And I think a diversity of de-risking perspectives is what I personally take from this, from this story, right? Uh, Doing big, expensive A-B tests is one way to de-risk something before you do it, but there are lots of other ways, some of which are way less expensive. Prototyping, putting things in front of people, doing discovery, doing different kinds of research, uh, learning from competitors, uh, the list goes on and on and on, most of which are less expensive than staffing up a data team. So again, I embrace uncertainty and try and evaluate uh, de-risk from a variety of perspectives, and I own subjectivity and I encourage my colleagues to do the same. Yeah, that's a beautifully said. De-risk from a variety of perspectives, not just one. Thank you for sharing that, Eli. Of course. Hey there. We hope you loved the episode. And before you go, don't forget to thank the folks at Tuple.app for being so generous with their stories and for their support for the podcast. So visit their website at tuple.app forward slash scrum, get their discount, and why not? Share them with your colleagues if you find that the app is useful. And remember, sharing is caring. <laughs>